Hello, everyone. Um, I have all sorts of note cards to go through today. Uh, the first one says introduce yourself because that's one of the worst things that I always do when I do lectures is I forget to tell you guys who I am. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Chelsea and I have been working with costuming for gosh. Um, Hold on, about 17 years now, I think. Woo. Um, so uh, I started getting into historical costuming about 12 years ago and um, have been going down that path ever since. Um, so I like to consider myself kind of a, a textile expert uh, when it comes to historical textiles, because the only way you can make a reproduction of one is to really understand the originals and study those as well. So today's lecture is going to be about uh, corsetry and binding undergarments. So we're gonna start a little bit before corsets became a thing and then go through corsetry and even go a little bit into modern day. Uh, and then afterwards we'll take, uh, I, I will do a quick break. Although uh, since we don't have a lot of you on the live portion, um, I'll probably skip the break and go right into making. Um, and if you need a break, of course, and you're watching the recording, you can stop this at any time, go back, rewatch. That's the whole point of the great uh, perks of a recording. Um, and then, of course, in the making section, we're going to go into what they used historically and what you can use today, uh, because obviously you're not going to have, you know, a nice industrial age, uh, you know, busk or anything like that uh, laying around um, necessarily. You never know. Um, so we'll go into what patterns work best and even talk a little bit, too, about creating stays and some of the older uh, corsetry and binding garments. So, all right, without further ado, we're going to do a little uh, share screen. There we go. Okay, so um, pictured, of course, on the background of this is a bunch of tool. It was the prettiest free picture I could find. Um, tool is not good for corsets, just gonna put that out there. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what came before uh, corsets. Now this particular set of stays is from the 17th century and it's sleeved, but I'm gonna go way, way, way back before that. Um, so what I wanna start discussing is your really early boned garments. So when we get back to the Middle Ages, um, you had kirtles and different outfits that were very, uh, some of them were very tight worn. And uh, they would actually have, um, because they were so heavy, they sometimes would have boning uh, sewn into them to kind of disperse the weight of them. Um, and as we get further into um, the 15th century, there was a garment called a coat, C-O-T-T-E, uh, which is actually the French word for rib. And it was a very tight fitting dress. And these are the first that had some simple versions of boning in the sides. Now, Italy became the first to be accredited with the uh, word busk because they started making garments that pointed down. So if you had, um, of course, I don't have a picture of that up, um, but if you had a uh, picture of Queen Elizabeth to look at, you'll notice that the front of her outfits kind of point down. And a lot of Elizabethan and early outfits, the bodices had that point. And what they had to do on a lot of these, and that was even before Queen Elizabeth, is add what was called a busk. So Italy got that first term because they created the fashion that used that. And that busk would typically be an insert in the front of the garment, in the front of the bodice, that would be wood or bone, sometimes even steel. Um, oh, and I have a note here that I was going to read a quote from 1608 about this. So this is actually um, a song and it was written down by F.W. Fairholt in the book, Satirical, Sir, bleh, excuse me, Satirical Songs and Poems on Costume. So I'm gonna read the song to you. I don't know how to sing it because it doesn't say what the tune is. It's called Ladies Favors. Lord, when I think what a paltry thing is a glove or a ring or a top of a fan to brag of and how much a naughty will triumph in a busk point Snatched with the tag of, then I say, well, fair him that hath ever cl used close play. Now, you'll notice the term busk appeared in this song, will triumph in a busk point. So that is referring to how the busk actually forced this outfit to look and kind of made it look more impressive. Um, and of course, it held it in place. So it was a, a triumph in itself. So as we go forward in time a bit more, we get into the 16th century and the skirt and bodice became separate pieces. Um, so you would actually have a nice you know, top again, let's think Queen Elizabeth. Um, and what happened is the weight of all these different items now being layered, you had to have something underneath to help keep that bodice straight. Otherwise it would actually kind of start to ride up on the person. So they had uh, what was called an under bodice. 
and it would have some light boning in it. Now they took the term from the men's costuming at the time um, and started calling it a waistcoat. So if you've ever seen uh, any re reference to older stays um, as a quilted waistcoat or something like that, um, that's because that was a very early term uh, for stays. And of course this waistcoat helped the outfit stay in place. So you can kind of guess where the next transition of clothing came from. Um, so boned under bod uh, bodices became popular and went even into the later half of the 17th century. And again, you'd still have some uh, quilted versions and things like that. So now that we're in the 17th century, we can take a look at this particular piece on the screen. Um, this one is really unique uh, because it actually has the little metal ends of the laces still on the tied sleeves. And this style with the sleeves being tied on was actually pretty popular on a lot of stays. There are versions without, uh, there are versions with. And if you'd like to see more pictures of this particular bodice, there's a lot of great detailed pictures from the Victoria, Albert, Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, so this was a front laced and has a separate stomacher that would slide in. So that's what that term is for this guy, if you've never seen one of those before. And um, the reason why you'd have the sleeves tied in is it also helped support the large sleeves on the outfits. Um, so these are, you know, kind of the, if you've ever seen in the Three Musketeers movies and the women have those big puffy dresses um, with the puffier sleeves and they're kind of low cut on the collar here, um, that is the type of stay that would go underneath. Now, as we move towards the 18th century, um, sometimes you'd even have uh, garments that have light boning in it and just a boned stomacher, which I'm going to show you an example of that when we finish the slideshow. I actually have a reproduction of one to show you. Um, so this is a really beautiful example. It's one of my favorite stays um, that is out there, uh, extant examples. Um, and you can see here, this is an inside view. And all of these pink things here are actual stitching. They did little uh, kind of cross hatch stitching over all of the seams to make sure they laid nice and flat um, after they put it together. And then of course the whole thing was bound. This is silk um, and of course the eyelets were hand done as well um, and it's just a beautiful example. So let's head into the 18th century. Um, so the 18th century uh, we see a lot of changes from the beginning. So you saw that that uh, original stay had a ton of different lines of boning in it and the boning at this point was reed or whale boning um, there was no metal boning that would be used yet. That would come later. Um, and if you'll notice too, the shape is not like a corset. It is more kind of cone. So you can see how it kind of comes in straight to the waist. And then these little um, peplums here point out, which would allow for the skirts to lay over it or petticoats at this time. So stays are really the first version of binding undergarments that we find popular. And there are even versions of stays that exist still that are made out of uh, iron, which are pretty cool. Um, I don't imagine they were that comfortable. You would definitely have to wear something underneath them, of course. Uh, this particular one laces in the back and a lot of our 18th century uh, examples, because they are uh, still a surviving, a lot of times the surviving ones are a little bit nicer and from richer people, upper class people, they would lace in the back. You would have to have somebody help you put them on, however. And this is something I want you to remember. At this point, stays had to have someone help you put them on if they laced in the back. Remember that when we get to the corset part, there's a reason. This one, if you notice, has a kind of a white line in the middle, but it has a wide front. You could actually put a wooden busk down the front of this to also help the front stay in place. And I have an example of one of those I will show you uh, when we are finished with the lecture. These busks many times were hand carved, a lot of times with love notes, and they would be made out of wood or bone, uh, a lot of times whale bone, and they would have scrimshaw sometimes on them. They are gorgeous if you've seen one in person, um, but they would sl be slid right down the front here. Now this has uh, cording and, this is a later example, so it has cording, which was a very small cord, uh, usually linen or cotton from the front, and then uh, boning here as well. Now stays were typically made out of natural fibers, so silk and linens, um, sometimes hemp canvases would be used to line them. Um, and uh, the later versions of these in the 18th century would actually be made out of uh, cotton scraps. So a lot of these lined uh, were made out of scraps. And that's something that is kind of a misconception that the outfits were perfect inside and out. I've seen a lot of extant examples where it is patchwork on the inside because that's what they had access to. 
Um, the back did not have grommets, it had hand done eyelets. So these eyelets are very fine um, and there was usually a lot of them. I've had the um, uh, privilege, we'll say, of doing lots and lots of hand done eyelets on the back of these. It's a lot of work. Um, so the way that this was laid out, you'd have your outer fabric and then you would usually have a lining fabric then your boning would go in between that and then have a backing fabric um, as well. So you would still line your outside or fashion fabric uh, because silk could not be on its own rubbing against the baleen or reed. And with reed, you'd have a quarter inch half round piece, essentially, it looks like basket reading, and you put two of those together to go into each of these uh, little uh, tunnel seams. And of course, it was all bound. Okay, so these are, we're now at the end of the 18th century. Again, this photo is from the Victorian Albert. You can see more photos of this example um, on their website. All right, so now we have transitioned to transitional stays. So we're getting closer now to the 19th century. Um, as our outfits changed, which I'm sure some of you have seen the style of outfits that they had, um, where you went from kind of your typical 18th century dress that you always see in movies where it's very tight down to the waist and then kind of puffs out gigantically um, to outfits that ended just below the breast. Um, they were called empire waist gowns and were heavily uh, influenced by the French culture and French designs. Um, a lot of the empire waist gowns and the police robes, which were a jacket worn over them, were actually taking some design ideas from the French military. Uh, France, for the longest time, has been the fashion center uh, for deciding what everybody around the Western civilization wears. Um, and that, of course, was even at this time. So these are also called short stays or jumps or transitional stays. Um, and you can see this is a shorter pair that ends just below the breast. There were also versions that did go all the way down, but they weren't as heavily boned as a lot of the previous examples. A lot of these would still have a busk down the front, um, usually be a very small little wooden piece, uh, which you can get reproductions of if you are making a pair of these sort of stays, and it would go down the front. Um, and if you notice, there's a small lacing here, and there was also a full lacing in the back, so you could kind of put them on yourself and lace it up just a little bit. The coolest thing about this is we start having the early, early industrial age at this point. So metal grommets, first patented in 1823, um, they became popular um, in mass production in 1828 um, by Thomas Rogers. And this saved a lot of time being able to have to sit there and do all those lovely hand done eyelets. Um, and of course, this was the first step as well for corsetry to be made more on a mass scale than just at home uh, by, by the wives and, and women. So we have now the option of metal um, eyelets. Metal busks. Now, right now we have wooden busks in the here, um, but let's let's scroll on to our, our next corset. Actually, this one is a wooden busk too, so I'm going to hold off on my, my uh, metal busk um, statement. So as we head into, from the 1820s um, into the 1830s, we're starting to see the transition getting closer to what we consider to be the nowadays modern corset. Um, you'll notice that this now has that curve and it's because the dresses that used to end right just below the breast started getting longer again. And there was a lot of beautiful pleating and gathering um, that would happen and ruching and a lot of uh, influence from Tudor styles with the sleeves that came back and they would kind of puff out from the waist. Um, so kind of getting to what would eventually be that Civil War look where the women look like a gigantic bell. Um, this had a lot of pad stitching in it and cording. Um, and you can see, uh, it's, of course, it's a, I can't zoom in on this, but you can see this picture, of course, with the Victorian Albert Museum. You can see there is definitely a large wooden busk that went in the front of this. And you'll see some outlines of the tunnel seams where there's actual boning. A lot of this is just stitching though, where you'd have all the layers together and they would stitch them heavily together to kind of flatten them and also give some support. Now, this gusset style, you're gonna see repeat in a later corset. Um, where it has gusts on either side. But this, because there's no boning holding it together, and the same thing for the previous corset, there's actually a gathered top. So there was a small string that would go through the top here and pull it together so that way, well, nothing fell out. All right, so let's talk about corsets, corset corsets. Um, now this 
corset on the left is really cool. And you'll notice that there is busks on them. So when did busks come around? Um, the first busk was actually invented in 1920, or sorry, 1829. Um, and they started being used uh, pretty much right after that. And why this is really important is because now women could put their corsetry on themselves. So it didn't matter if they were upper class or lower class, they could have a nice corset and not have to worry about having servants to tie them up into their binding undergarments. So this is a big, big change. And the way that it was laced in the back also changed, which I didn't mention, but um, if you'll notice the, the pink one, um, which I can go back to at some point was spiral laced, which means if there were grommets, it would be kind of spiraled down those lacing. And that way you could pull it from the top and just quickly tie it up. These laced from the back, which helped pull uh, from the mid back, you have a little loop, which I'm gonna show you after the lecture of how that is laced up. And you would pull it, which would pull everything tight to the waist, uh, which is where we want to accent. Now, um, I have, think I have another close up picture of this for the flossing later on, but this guy I wanna bring attention to. If you notice it, it looks kind of weird, like something's going on here. It's not actually that there's embroidery. This is a woven corset. So in 1832, Jean Werley, which I'm not sure if I'm saying his name correctly, who was a Frenchman, took out a patent for woven corsets. These gussets here were incorporated into the weaving process. So the whole thing was actually made in a weaving machine. It was woven like this. And then the boning was added afterwards in, uh, you can see these, these channels that were added after on top of it. And of course the busk, um, which made it much quicker to manufacture and also much more comfortable because they were you know, not having all these heavy seams that were grinding against your body. Um, so they actually stayed popular into the late 19th century. So woven corsets are a really cool thing. There are a few examples. This is one again with the Victorian Albert Museum, which the only reason I'm using all of their photos is because I was able to get written permission to use all of their photos for this lecture and they're a fantastic museum. Um, <clears throat> So one of the other things I wanted to draw attention to, which I don't remember if I show this in a future slide, but you'll notice that there's this stitching here. These are gussets that were sewn in separate. These are ones that were woven in. These, because they were sewn in separately, had a little bit of a raw edge of fabric that would be sticking out and they had to be whip stitched by hand to make sure that that fabric didn't fray. So fun fact, these guys had a lot more work and we're gonna go over into the flossing details in a later slide. Um, now, interestingly enough, we also have two colors of corsets. White, for some reason, was commonly thought to be more ladylike to be worn. Um, I assume just because that way you don't have colors bleeding out into other fabrics or just because traditionally a lot of, um, actually I have no idea why. <laughs> Unfortunately, it was just a statement that was said in a few different publications in the early 19th century um, into the late 19th century. And there's not necessarily a statement as to why. You could probably do a whole research project as to why white undergarments are more ladylike. It's a very interesting um, research project. Uh, but these blue fabrics and colored fabrics were actually more economical because if you were making it yourself um, or if you were a factory making them, you could use dress scraps to make the corsets out of um, what you had left over in silk because these take very small pieces. It takes less than a yard typically to make a corset. So if you have small scraps, there you go. Um, and in fact, a corset that I'm gonna be showing you, a couple of them were made out of dress scraps that I made dress orders for, had scraps left over and went, hey, let's make a corset. Okay, so busks. We talked a little bit about the in invention of busks. And you'll notice that these are modern busks here. This is one of the companies that I recommend getting supplies from, which is called bra and corset supplies.com. Um, but busks were a big thing. So first of all, busks, of course, as I said before, allowed women to put the corsets on and lace them up themselves. This cool guy here is called a spoon busk. So the reason why this was important is because as we head to the mid 19th century, Corsets got really, really heavy. There was cording, there was boning, and they wanted to pull your waist in really tight. And the corsets honestly had to be heavy because if you saw the layers of outfits they wore, um, again, that typical Southern Belle um, look where you have the giant gowns uh, with the hoop skirts and petticoats on top of that, uh, you needed something to really disperse and be able to hold that weight up of the dress. 
So these spoon busks were an innovation that came out in 1873. They were patented in 1873 at least. And they grew in fashion by the late 1870s and into the uh, late or early 1880s. The last one that um, is in existence in a museum, I believe is 1889. So they did stay around for a while. And I have some pictures of some corsets with a spoon busk. I do not have one um, to show you that I've made, um, but I do actually have a real spoon busk that I'll show you after the lecture is done, not an original. Um, of course, but uh, a reproduction. Now, um, the earlier busks, which you can see in that previous slide, um, and a few of the other corsets that I show you actually have little hooks and eyes. So these are modern, there's a little dot and a little hook thing, like a little um, loop that goes around it. There's probably a technical term for that. Um, but the earlier ones would have just a couple of these and had a little hook that would come into that instead. So I imagine it was a little harder to put on, um, which is why they eventually came out with this style with a little dot, which makes it much easier to kind of pull your corset um, together enough to get it looped up. These guys, as you can see, come in a lot of colors because modern day they do. Um, originally, a lot of them were brass um, or steel. So there wasn't a huge array of color choices. Here is an example of a corset with a spoon busk in it. This is actually one of my favorite corsets out there. Um, this is a silk corset with leather casing on it. It's beautiful. Um, and of course the lace on top. Um, this is a 1880s style, later 1880s, um, based on the simplicity of it. Um, and if you'll notice, this corset is not lined. Well, I guess you probably can't tell that because you're not looking at the inside. But I wanna talk very quickly about lining on corsets. When um, I first started talking about corsets uh, and started making them uh, last year, actually, I've, I've only been making historical corsets for about a year now. Uh, I had somebody say, why are you lining your corsets? They were never lined. And that is true and not true at the same time. I actually did some research into it because I know I've seen lined versions, but then I also have seen unlined versions. And according to garment historian Nora Wo, um, there were both depending on the type of fabric you used. So if you had a very good quality, expensive fabric, like this heavy silk here, then you would have an unlined corset, where if you had a cheaper fabric, you had to line it because it would not withhold just casings sewn on it. It would have to be lined to hold the weight of the boning. So it depended on what you could afford. Cheaper corsets were lined, more expensive ones were not. It's a pretty fun fact. All right, so now we're into, ooh, that's did a fun little thing with the letters now. Um, the later half of the 19th century, um, there was a little fight back after those really heavily boned corsets, which I didn't have a picture of an original one that has the 50 layers of cording and stuff, but I do have a reproduction that I can show you um, later in a picture that shows all of that. Now, um, these are athletic corsets. So of course, women still had to go bike riding and um, you know ride horses, play tennis, go out on boats and do all sorts of things that were physical. And that was very hard to do in a corset that was heavily boned. So ribbon corsets and athletic corsets were versions of these that were lightly boned. I actually have an original and extant example from the, um, I actually got it dated recently. I found the manufacturing company um, and it's from the 1880s to 1890s. Um, and these were made only with four parts of boning. So you'd have your busk in the front, it would lace in the back and there would be boning on either side of the lacing and then just here on the sides and that's it. And as you can see, it's just strips here. It's very open and very airy. So you could breathe really nicely in them. Um, so there was different versions of these two. Um, I forget where, I think the Met has one that actually has mesh in between. Um, and they were very, very rarely lined. Um, some of them were lined again because they used cheaper ribbon and had to line them, um, but these were a really nice example. Now, before these came out, as I said, there was really, really heavy corsets. Um, what's really interesting about those heavy corsets is they actually got so heavy with so many pieces of cording and so much boning that they wound up having to put them on mannequins and starting in the late 1860s, actually steam molded them onto these mannequins to pre-shape them before selling them to consumers because otherwise they would, they would not be able to shape properly. Um, so that was one of the downfalls of having so many layers on a corset um, is that you had to steam it, which is kind of cool that they would actually steam mold uh, those corsets. I imagine though, quite uncomfortable. 
All right, so now we're into some of our small details. So here's that lovely uh, corset again. And I already had talked a little bit about the whip stitching. And now you can see a little bit of this early busk. There's actually a button on top. And unfortunately, I don't think the Vic uh, Victoria and Albert Museum has a picture of this with it open so you can see what this button is. But I'm wondering if it's a hook here and then kind of a very simple style busk here. So flossing is a very important thing that um, we're going to be talking about in the manufacture part of uh, corsetry. But these little triangles going all along the hip gusset are called flossing. And these were actually sewn um, in between and around and sometimes even through the spiral steel boning to help hold it in place and to also help affect it or I guess avoid it from rubbing into uh, the seams. So nowadays we have little metal caps and we can even dip them into resin or rubber and cool stuff like that um, when we cut them. Uh, like I actually have a bunch that are pre-dipped into rubber that I'm gonna show you, um, but then they cut them and they would file them down as best as they could, but you still have very sharp metal bits. So this helped pull the lacing away from the seam, which allowed it to, well, not shred through. Because um, as a lot of modern women have experienced uh, having a uh, underwire thing pop out and poke you, I imagine a very sharp piece of spiral steel would be even worse. So flossing is a very important aspect. There are a lot of uh, corsetry that had beautiful uh, and flossing with all sorts of details with little flowers and designs. Um, these are also called personal embellishments. And there was actually a large movement in the 19th century to add embroidery onto things like socks, um, you know, your chemises, corsetry, and things like that, where only the woman would see it. It was just for her. And if you had money, that was something that you could do as a pastime, was of course embroider things, um, any, any undergarments and things like that. Okay, so after we get out of the 19th century, we are now heading into the 20th century and the corsets got longer. And this, this shape is a very interesting one. We have that S shape um, where the busk is so long, and this is not an exaggerated example, um, but I have some, some images of, of very exaggerated examples where the busk actually comes down to the groin. And this was the worst, part or uh, worst version of corsets that they made um, because it actually forced the woman to stick her rear end out and her chest forward forcing her to do this weird angle um, where she stood so if you see you know the gibson girl sort of thing she she's standing like that and there's a reason why um, so this was actually quite dangerous um, for women uh, because that did the most amount of damage with pushing that their body into a, a weird position um, not that it broke uh, any type of ribs or anything like that, but it just forced that shape. Um, and these were longer and even had, they had gussets that came down. And of course you have your early um, garters. So before this in the 18th century, which of course I did not mention anything about garters, um, garters were tie-ons and you would tie them onto the tops of your stockings to make sure they didn't fall down. By the time we get to the 19th century, you actually had garters that had little hooks and um, things like that to help keep everything on there as well so you didn't have to tie them. Towards the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, they attached them to the corsets, um, which is a style that would stay um, into the 1950s and even later with uh, girdles and things like that that would have these attached garters. In fact, I don't even think you can get separate garters as much anymore. Um, they seem to always be attached to something <laughs> nowadays. Um, but it helped because our stockings did not have elastic. Um, however, um, elastic did come into play um, later in the Edwardian time period. In fact, in 1911, that was the first time you found elastic building in corsetry. So 1911. So um, not too much after this particular corset, which is from 1905 from again, the Victorian Albert Museum, they actually were able to add elastic belting. So some examples of corsets, if you see them and they have an elastic belt, you can date them saying, oh, well, it's gotta be at least 1911 or later. Um, so that's one cool fact. And you'll also notice there is a clip here, this little hook. Um, this was actually to help hook up um, petticoats and things like that. Uh, they would have kind of hooks around for your petticoat um, to hook to because <clears throat> these were straighter cut skirts. And as you see, this doesn't pull you in as much around the waist. Um, so that way it would help hold everything up. 
Now, as we reach uh, the end of what we consider to be the typical core set, um, many people do blame suffrage on that, but it really had nothing to do with suffrage. Um, as I said here, the movements were separate ones that seem to have crossed paths at the same time into a new progressive nation, uh, which is true. Uh, at this time period, uh, we have World War I, which was actually the big reason why corsetry saw an end. Um, and unfortunately, as many of you may know, France kind of got slapped around in a lot of the uh, world wars um, and prior. Um, and France being that who designs fashions and provided a lot of these new ideas and innovations, there wasn't really much new fabric and um, costume design that came out during World War I. The other issue is a lot of women had to go to work doing the men's jobs while the men were out fighting the war. And even some women went overseas like that of the Hello Girls um, to go and aid in the war. And they didn't have corsets necessarily, they had girdles, um, which were lightly boned, kind of like the athletic corsets um, that would just kind of hold everything in place for the most part to make them still look professional or seemly for the, the time period, but not necessarily bind them. Now, um, after World War I was over, there was quite a fight about going back into corsetry, which is why in the 1920s, um, corsets still existed. However, they were a lot different. Um, and then a lot of them actually started at the waist and went down um, to kind of hold in the bottom half of the body. And you saw this very um, straight cut sort of fashion that more accented the shoulders because fashion designers, now that they can't accent the waist, had no idea what to do. So they did um, very low cut backs and shoulders that were open with beads and all sorts of beautiful work on them to kind of bring attention to that area of the body instead. Now, um, the corset of course still existed. And in World War II, there was actually a very large debate about girdles, uh, which I wanted to bring a little attention to. So in World War II, we have the Women's Army Corps trying to get their, their start. Um, they started off as a Women's Auxiliary Army Corps. And um, in the original meetings with Congress, trying to get the Auxiliary Army Corps to the regular Army Corps, the biggest issue that Congress had was whether or not women would be required to wear girdles. And it was brought up in multiple news interviews with the Army and different congressional meetings. Um, in, I believe, March and February in 43, there was two different congressional meetings about it. And they kept, it kept getting brought up. Um, making sure that the women had to wear girdles because that idea of a corseted woman was still not gone. Um, the girdles were very important and again, kept that seemly more attractive look. Um, now, corsetry has gone on. You can still purchase corsets. Um, there's websites like Corset Story that sells reproductions um, and very fantasy, beautiful looking versions. Sorry, I had to take a sip of water. Um, so corsets have never fully gone away. They've just transformed for the different styles and eras. Um, and nowadays women wear corsets not because they have to, but because they want to. Where beforehand in the 19th century, if you did not, you were considered to be a loose woman, quite literally. Um, and same thing in the 18th century. Um, now to go back to the 18th century and 19th century a little bit with uh, garments, they did not have slews of these undergarments. Um, in the 18th century, there was a huge fire that went through London and they had insurance reports that said how many items these people lost. And what's interesting about this particular street is that there were people who were very poor up to people who had a lot of money. So they were able to compare what items these different types of people had. Uh, the poorest of which did not have any stays that she lost in the fire because she was wearing her one set. The middle class had one set that they lost, one set they were wearing, and the upper class had maybe one extra set. So that's still only three sets for a woman who had a lot of money. Or if you think about nowadays, I don't know, I probably have about 20 bras shoved in a drawer upstairs. Doesn't mean I use them, but you know, it's a completely different uh, level of consumerism. In the 19th century, it was uh, similar up until we get to the point where you can purchase them commercially and they would sell them through catalogs um, like uh, Sears and things like that. They would actually sell um, in Wentworth, they would actually sell the, the corsets right in there and you could just buy them. Um, as we saw the shift from the more um, maker, the woman as the maker to a woman as a consumer after uh, the Revolutionary War and after the War of 1812, there was a huge push 
um, in economics for, for women to now become the consumer. And so there were a lot more corsets. I don't know if there's specific data of how many corsets women owned. Um, and I would love to see that if I can find data on that at some point. Okay, so at this point, uh, there's our short break. Um, but unless uh, anyone needs a break, I'm getting a no. Okay, I'm gonna chug some tea really quick. Ooh, all right, so what I'm gonna do is I am going to stop the screen share for a moment. There I am. Okay. So um, what I wanted to go into, because we went through the history part a little faster than I anticipated. Um, I'm so used to doing larger lectures where I have uh, questions that come out uh, blurted out in the middle of them. So I apologize if I kind of blurted out the history at you. Um, we're going to call it word vomit of history. Um, <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about next was the construction and what went into the different garments. Um, so I was going to start with the earlier thing that I have here. So the earliest thing that I have personally recreated is a stomacher from the late 17th century. I have not yet had a chance to make an actual set of stays from that time period that's on my list, but that's this guy. Um, and this is from Dress Scraps. Um, and it is lined actually with a couple different things. This on the back is a linen, just a linen canvas. Underneath the silk on the front, is actually another layer of canvas. And I think it's, I think it's also a linen canvas. Um, some of the things I've made are lined with hemp canvas as well. Um, hemp canvas was a little heavier and a little cheaper at that time. Um, although it was also used in sailing ships on their sails, kind of fun fact of the day. Um, so this is completely hand sewn. You can, I don't know if you can see really close there, but there's lots of little stitches into this thing. Uh, we won't talk about how long this took me to make. Um, and these little tabs are also boned, but they're boned uh, separately between the two layers of canvas with the silk being an over uh, cover. This was worn here and then your dress would actually get pinned to it. Um, so if you had a set of stays, you could even wear this over it. Um, and this was worn with what was called a mantua, which was a very loose sort of gown that was pleated to the shape of the body. It was kind of this weird transitional dress that happened between the late 17th century and early 18th century. This is made with lots and lots of reed boning. Um, you can see all little channel seams. Every single one of those little tunnel seams has reed in them. Um, and when you are working with reed, it is frustrating because it likes to break. However, if it breaks while you're wearing it or even after you get it in the channel, reed likes to hold together. And with all the other pieces of reed kind of reinforcing it, it's not a big deal. The coolest thing about reed is as you sweat, it actually shapes to you. So you don't need to do any of that steam molding of the 1860s, it does that automatically. Um, after I wear a set of stays uh, during reenacting and if I sweat in it and I take it off, I can actually stand it up and it's shaped like me, which is weird, but kind of cool of how that works. So um, this was made very slowly um, where I did all of the ch uh, channel seams first and then sat, usually you put on a nice film for this and you sit and you put in all the reed and you take your time on it. Um, the longest time, of course, is all of these seams. They're quarter inch seams and you wanna make sure to measure them all out. I suggest a chalk. Um, I use a chalk aligner. It's a really cool pencil with a wheel in it. And um, yeah, that's that. So this pattern is from Nora Woe's Patterns of Fashion, I believe. Oh, no, sorry, Pattern Patterns of Fashion 5 to talk a little bit about patterns. This is the book. Um, it is actually a new one, uh, or sorry, Janet Arnold, wrong author. And I'm gonna show you, where's my bookmark fill out? I can show you the picture of the original that it was based off of. So if you are curious about um, how to make these, I really suggest looking up Janet Arnold's books. They are going to be reprinted soon um, by the School of Historical Dress in England. Um, they have actually been out of print for a long time and uh, beforehand were very expensive where each of these books were about a couple hundred bucks. No joke. Okay, hold on. If I can't find it soon, I'll give up, but I can actually show some pictures. Now, unfortunately, all of her stuff in here is copyrighted, but here's a really interesting early set of stays um, with the point. So that's more that Elizabethan look. So I'll, I'll find the picture of it later, but that's in Patterns of Fashion 5. 
um, which is a great book on just um, bodies, stays, hoops, and rumps. That's actually what it says is the subtitle. And I realized I didn't grab my actual stays, so I'm gonna jump out real quick and grab my stays. I'll be right back. All right, so these were, um, I've been working on because I was very lazy when I first made these and I never actually put in eyelets. So I've been actually sewing myself into them um, and I have never lined them either. So this, this is a set of stays that has a front stomacher. This is actually made with hemp canvas, which was again, an original material that they used to line it. Um, the binding on the edge is wool. And then this on the back is actually gingham. And there's a bunch of examples of original stays that are lined with gingham. This is a mid 18th century style stay. And this is another panel. See, as you can see, I'm still working on my beautiful eyelets. I only have like, I don't know, 60 more to go. <laughs> um, so this is all done with wool thread as well. You could also use silk, but these are supposed to be more of a lower class version of stays. Um, so I wanted to use wool and cheaper materials. So these are how they would sit. And that would sit there and you would put it on your body. So it's pretty cool looking uh, when it's done. Um, and at least it will be. And these I've had for years, I have, I don't actually remember, maybe I made these in 2016, 15, I think 2015 I made them. And um, that's how long it took me to actually put the eyelets in. Uh, so don't feel bad. But if you're if you're doing a project like this and it takes forever, uh, but it's a this took forever to do. It's all hand sewn again, um, and it just is one of those you got to keep with um, and and work on. This one, if I wanted to, I could have left a little uh, tunnel seam here and put our wooden busk. So this is an example of a wooden busk, and as you can see, I could have put one of these in the back. And ooh, there we go. I was actually going to and then decided not to because there is enough going on with all of the boning in this and I just don't feel like uh, doing that as well. So um, the other thing I wanted to show you was what the reed looked like for this era. So this is a big pile of reed. I'm gonna try not to stab myself with it. But as you can see, it is just a very small little, you can kind of see the end there. Um, just a, a, a half round quarter inch reed. And you can buy them in rolls. I cheat, I get them off of Amazon as basket weaving and you can get a lot of them for that. And of course, um, if you're gonna order off of Amazon, use Amazon Smile. And I hear you can use the Wyndham Textile Museum, uh, built, bleh, Wyndham Textile and History Museum as your Smile account um, to help raise money for them. Um, so, that's, you're gonna need probably one full roll of it and one full roll will make about two sets of stays. So not too bad. Um, so from the stays, um, I wanted to talk quickly about patterns that work for stays. The one that I recommend, as soon as I unbury it, um, these guys are Larkin and Smith. Um, that's the stays that I made there. Um, unfortunately, their company doesn't exist anymore, um, but they're supposedly being bought out by somebody else. But so once they do, they'll, they're supposedly going to be reprinting these. So I really recommend if you can find a copy of this to use it first, they come with a whole booklet in here on how to make it, which um, as you can see, this is the book and they include research and documentation for, for their stays. So it is a really wonderful uh, way to introduce yourself into stays. If not, there are other companies that have patterns out there. Um, of course, I still recommend getting the patterns of Fashion 5, uh, but there's also the JP Ryan versions, which um, I did not find that these sat as well on me. Um, so I did make this set. And then a new one I just picked up, which I have not tried yet, is Scroop patterns. And they are very similar to the JP Ryan ones, uh, but they have a little lacing on the top here, which is based on an extant example from the 1770s and 1780s. Um, so um, these are another great, great pattern. I just haven't tried it yet, so I can't tell you whether or not they're awesome. Now, if you notice one thing too on the stays, which I don't think I mentioned, they always have straps where corsetry does not. So um, your stays, 
they always have straps. Um, and I think that was to kind of help disperse it and kind of hold everything up where the corsets tied uh, tighter around the body um, and forced themselves to stay in place. The stays did not do that. Now for transitional stays, I don't have an example to show you um, because I have not made a set yet, but I did pick up a pattern from the company Red Threaded. They're another one. Um, that's their, their printed pattern. You can get them right off of Etsy or order paper versions off of their website. Um, and Red Threaded is, they have a lot of very simple patterns. Their instructions are really good. So again, a great beginners. Um, and for your Regency stays, you're, you can actually use different fabrics besides linen and cotton, uh, or sorry, linen and Kemp canvas. Um, you can even use cotton fabric at that point because cotton, uh, the cotton industry in the United States were, was pretty much, well, excuse the pun, but blooming. Um, so you can uh, definitely use cotton fabrics. Um, they, I wouldn't use a cotton quilting fabric, something a little heavier like a duck canvas or something like that, or a heavy upholstery cotton works great as well. Um, and they would have been using cotton at that time. So um, that's our short stays and you could do hand on eyelets on that, or depending if you're doing later uh, stays, as I said before, you could technically get away with metal grommets. So actual corsets, I have a couple examples here that I've made. Um, and including one of a ribbon corset. And then I have some pictures of some other ones that I've made that I don't have with me uh, because they are actually at multiple museums at the moment. So, and I realized that I'm like, oh man, all of my corsets are gone. Um, so what I wanna show you um, are these two, uh, oops, this side, I have this mirrored. So this corset here, which I'm actually gonna take off. This is one that I have not even finished yet. I was requested to make a civil war corset um, for a museum out in Utah. And I have to have it done by next week. So I got the most of it done. I just haven't put the grommets in. So it's actually held in by pins. And this, by the way, is my S shaped mannequin. It's a very weird shape, but this is my S shaped mannequin, as you can see. Slider away. So this here is a gusseted corset from about the 1860s. Um, and so the way that these are made is they had little gussets here to kind of shape for the, the breast, and then also a gusset for the hips here on the bottom. And the reason why is they wanted you to have that hourglass look. You had very big skirts and dresses, and then also a puffy top on the top that came in perfectly at the waist. So that was that typical hourglass. And this is not line. As you can see, these have channel seams um, or channeling in the inside of the corset rather than on the outside. And depending on the corset, some of these were on the inside, some of them were on the outside. Uh, I chose to do inside for this. And um, I did some modern things. So if you are making an unlined corset, you may wanna do things like serging um, on the inside so that way it doesn't come apart. Obviously they didn't have access to that. Um, I believe, I don't remember exactly the first year that the uh, Merrill lock machines and the sergers came out, um, but they definitely did not have access to them during the Civil War. Um, in fact, sewing machines were around since before then, of course, but they weren't always used on every garment. Um, it depends on who they were and what they were doing. So they was still kind of catching on. Um, and, and of course, I have all the information about sewing machines in a different paper, but um, the first man who created the sewing machine, his factory actually got burnt down and he got chased out of France because uh, the tailors were so upset and stressed out that they were gonna lose their jobs. So I always find that kind of funny, terrible, but funny. Um, so, so these guys have all of this on the inside. And you know, I chose to do some things like top stitch the, um, this is reflecting so badly in the light. I chose to top stitch the, the um, hip gusset um, to kind of help keep it down. Um, and of course, all of these have steel boning in it, so the spiral steel. And this has a regular modern busk that you can purchase because they did have those at that point. Um, this was kind of a, uh, there's, I'm not really sure if there's a term for it, but it is a ribbon that goes along um, the waist. So it actually sits right at your natural waist, which is also where you would tighten this when you're wearing it. So that way it kind of pulls everything together. So it keeps that area flat. Um, so eventually I have to put the grommets in, which are going to go here. And of course I can use metal grommets and the steel boning 
that I use. I usually buy it in a big roll, but of course ran out. So I'm going to show you some of the strip. Um, this is spiral steel. And I'm going to show you an original example of what it looked like because it did not look like this then. Um, it was like this, but then it was actually stitched over, almost wrapped in thread. Um, these are dipped in rubber, which of course is really cool, but not something that existed at the time as well. So you can buy modern versions where they have caps on them, which are little metal caps or dipped in rubber. Um, then they would not, they would actually just be raw edges. Um, now moving right along, we have, this is our 1890s one. This is my favorite corset. Um, I'll move this a little bit so you can see it a little better. So this one has flossing on it and I tried to do a little bit more decorative. And um, it's of course on an actual chemise. So the way that you would layer up at the time is you'd have your chemise underneath, then you put your corset on, then you'd actually put a corset cover over that. Then you would put on your petticoats and your dress, sometimes even a shirt and a vest and then a jacket, depending on which era specific you were looking for. So there was a lot of layers than just what you see here. Um, the 18th century was somewhat simpler where you had your um, smock or uh, shift, then your stays, then your petticoats, and then your overdress and stomacher. So um, I still personally feel the idea of stomachers should come back because you would just pin them to where you were sized that day. Um, so if you were a little bloated, you pin it a little out. If you were really thin that day and woke up like a supermodel, you pin it in a little bit. So either way, but this guy, I can actually show you the lacing on. So as you can see, the tie is actually in the middle. And um, this would be tightened through here, through these loops. And this is a little bit big for my mannequin because it's actually made for me size. Um, and this is an antique mannequin from the 1920s um, from New Balance, cool enough, because they've been around that long. Um, but so she's a little bit bigger than I am, uh, but this would be laced with the tie up here. And this is where you'd actually tighten um, like that. So there are some images of women who actually have this tightened and pulled around their waist and tied in the front. Um, and you can find a few pictures of, of women that, that have that. So I always find that kind of cool that women didn't just tie it in the back. So let's see if I can get this off of my mannequin. It was hard enough getting it on my mannequin. And this happens to me when I wear these things too. You can never loosen them in the right places. I think it's stuck. <laughs> Wait, ah, okay. <laughs> Woo. So this one is lined. I'll just squish that out of the way. Um, so unlike the other one, I have lining. So I would uh, actually piece this together and I have pictures of the construction of this um, as I went. So you can see how this was pieced. Um, and the tunnel seams were sewn between the lining and the outer fabric, and then it was bound. And then our flossing was put in afterwards. And some of these little points here are actually sewn in between the spiral steel. So it really is not gonna move anywhere. This is made uh, with a rayon satin. Oops, sorry about the Blair Witch moment. There we go. Um, so this is made with a rayon satin um, and the lining is a cotton canvas. So um, I also did interface the satin, which is a modern technique, but you could use um, a horsehair interfacing, which did exist in the 19th century. Um, horsehair was probably one of the most versatile textile-like things out there, in my opinion. You could stuff a chair with it. You could use it for interfacing. Um, I have a list somewhere of all the different uses for horsehair, but that's this one. So this is our, our 1890s. Now, if you notice, this is made in very simple panels where our Civil War one had gussets and all sorts of crazy stuff. So this actually, when fabric got a little bit lighter and we didn't have those huge, um, we went from the, I guess, romantic and uh, uh, hoop skirt era to the Belle Epoque and the natural form era, you actually had a little bit less in the way of layers, even though it doesn't look like that, um, where the dresses were a little bit straighter rather than straight out. And so you didn't need as much uh, to hold all of that up. Um, and you would also have your hoop skirts um, turned into 
uh, bustle uh, cages and things like that. Uh, my favorite being the lobster tail bustle cage where it had bustling going down the back and metal wiring going down the back as well to hold that um, ruffles and things. I can actually show you guys a picture of that. I have a pattern for it somewhere. I think it's right here. Uh -huh. So um, this is uh, another pattern company that's great, but this is uh, how it actually would look here with the wiring down the edge. Um, and this company, by the way, is truly Victorian. They're my favorite for 19th century patterning. And um, they base all of their stuff off of original patterns that they have on their collection. So they are original patterns that they actually add instructions to. Because weirdly enough, 19th century didn't really do instructions. That wasn't a thing until at least the 1920s. <laughs> They would kind of just have some basic stuff written on the back of the envelope, but not so much with the written instructions like we have nowadays. Okay, so that's 1890s. Now, um, next, I'm going to repeat all this. I'm going to go back to the slideshow and show you construction pictures. Um, but the next one is a ribbon corset. So there was a pink one that was on the cover photo for our uh, lecture. And unfortunately, that one is in Utah at the moment. But I have the first one I made, which is a mock up using very cheap, very cheap ribbon. Um, from Michaels, and that's this guy. It is lined because the uh, the ribbon is so cheap that it would not hold on its own. Um, so I had to line it to kind of keep it together. But this is really cool because you can, you know, the ribbon is not sitting in place. It's only being held by the seams on the side, the grommets in the back, and of course the busk in the front. And this is an under bust. So it was again under that athletic corset uh, category. So um, to show you the lining, you can see the construction a little bit better. So it's a very simple styled uh, corset, just a few pieces that go to it. So, um, so these, this is a pattern that you can get for free from ribbon, uh, sorry, araneablack.com. So A-R-A-N-E-A -A -E -A black.com. And you can print it off free. Um, and there's not really much instruction of how to make it, but I have some pictures on how this was crafted um, to, to make it itself. Now, um, for later stuff, I don't have, actually, before I continue, let me show you my example. And I don't have my gloves on, I'm just gonna apologize now. But this here, I hate velvet, so I'm gonna twitch while holding this, whew, is a uh, original example of an athletic styled corset. It is an underbust. And um, the way that this was made, so you can see all the different uh, boning pieces. There was originally a waistband in here with a clasp. And apparently these are made by a company in France. Um, and I don't remember the name, uh, start with a W, but they were actually made out of dress scraps and they would sell them um, all pre-made. I thought this was made at home because it looked like it was made out of, out of scraps, but it was not. Um, it was actually made um, by a company. So I think there's a piece of boning sticking out. I feel like it's this piece that you can actually see a little bit. Yeah. So I'm going to try to hold this up. So you can kind of see all the little strings in there. So the, the boning in it was Pretty much it was spiral steel but then covered and wrapped in thread so it was a lot different than what we think spiral steel should look like today um, and then this corset would it actually had hooks and eyes in the front here hooks and eyes and then a little bit of lacing on the top um, but it's not even like sewn late like there's just little holes kind of punched in here and i'm not sure what's behind here because it's very um there's probably some pretty heavy boning, but there's something else that's kind of holding this together where the eyelets are. Who knows, could be horsehair. Um, <laughs> but it's a beautiful example. Um, and if you look very close at it um, on the bottom here, you can kind of see the seams. So it was uh, pieced together out of scraps. So a very cool example. I'm going to put that back in its tissue paper home. There we go. Okay, so um, when we get to later corsets, we go from the spiral steel to what's called a spring steel, which also sounds like springsteen, which is not actually something you can use in corsets. Um, but this is spring steel. So spring steel literally means 
it springs. It's a solid steel. Um, and that's what a lot of modern um, corsetry uses today. They'll use just kind of a spring steel because it's easier. Um, you can actually, this is coated where originally it was not coated. <laughs> See, this has this beautiful plastic coating and I could just take a, um, a torch and just kind of melt it onto the end and it would actually seal this. Um, original spring steel was just literally steel. It was very sharp. They would try to file it down, but you know, not necessarily successfully. So um, they would sometimes put padding or um, covers on the end to help kind of protect it from popping out. But this was a later um, thing that they would use because it was cheaper to manufacture. So in the 18, or sorry, 1920s and later, you'd see a lot of the spring steel being used and also in the, the early Edwardian uh, corsets. Now this lovely, zip tie that's holding this all together. This is what a lot of modern costumers use. Don't do that, it's bad. Um, the reason why is because this stuff bends and it will not bend back into shape. And I see so many people who use zip ties and yes, they're very, very cheap, but they really do not work. I have, I tried that when I first started and they make corsets that come out like this because they, they bend on you. So be very cautious doing um, zip ties. You can find reed boning for very cheap and a lot of times your spring steel, you can even get this stuff on Amazon. Um, my favorite though is corsetmaking.com. You can order these in the roll like this. Now our modern busks, this is your modern busk that you can find. Um, you can get them in any sort of measurement from seven inches up till 16 inches, depending on what you're looking for, probably even longer than that. Um, I think this one's a 13 inch, somewhere I have a, yeah, 13 inch, this is a 13 inch. Um, and I get them in all sorts of different lengths because you never know if you're making a bunch of them of what your pattern will call for or what the era calls for because corsets started off um, like your Regency ones, they're short, but then they got really long again. Then they get short again by the mid 19th century and then they get really long. So it depends on which era you're doing of how long your busk should be, how long your corset boning should be and um, and how long your corset should be. So keep that in mind. It's not just the length of your actual torso. Uh, one other type of boning that I didn't show you guys, this is a piece of baleen. This is from a, a wrecked 19th century uh, gown that I purchased on um, uh, auction. And uh, all of, it was completely falling apart, but it had a lot of construction pieces that are great to use as examples. So this is baleen. I was surprised to find out that they were black. I always assumed whales, you know, because of all the whale bones were white, but the baleen is not. Um, there are some white pieces that you can find, but most of them that I've seen in real life are black. All right, and then our spoon busk. This guy is super cool. These you can also buy um, to make corsets with. I have uh, a pattern that is an original uh, 1878 corset pattern that I bought online from France. The pattern's all in French, so I'm going to make it one day. Hopefully I'll be able to read it. <laughs> but this is what the spoon busk is. And this is pretty similar to what they were. They were pretty much like this one is, I think, laser cut, um, but they were pretty much cut out like this. They were not smooth. Um, They're actually rather sharp. Uh, They're usually thicker. This is very thin, as you can see. Um, and that's it. It's just a very odd looking busk. And the spoon would sit towards the base of your corset, which would help kind of, um, I guess it, it was supposed to help with the weightiness of the corset. I'm not really sure exactly on the science of that, but um, it's what it did. And they stayed uh, popular for quite a while. So that's those. Now, um, your later corsets, when it comes to patterns, I have like my stack of stuff here. So um, I have a couple patterns. I'm gonna show you the one I always use. The um, beautiful bronze colored corset was uh, Truly Victorian TV uh, 110 here. This is a great beginner's corset pattern. Um, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be, like a lot easier. Another great company is Laughing Moon. Um, and they have uh, one that has a uh, gusset pattern, a regular 1890s corset. And this particular pattern also comes with a chemise and drawers, uh, which your drawers were typically crotchless because they would be worn under the corset. And that's, well, the only way you could use the bathroom. Our Edwardian corset, um, again, truly Victorian has a really nice one. As you can see, they're very long because I didn't have a picture of one I've made. 
But uh, as you can, this is a nicer one than the one I had on the mannequin there for the Victorian Albert. You can see how long it was and it comes down um, past the, the hips. My husband calls those, uh, instead of corsets, he calls them butt sits. That's your joke of the night. All right, so I'm gonna quickly move all this stuff out of my way. There we go. And we're gonna go back to a share screen and go back into our corset lecture so I can show you some of the construction methods. Oh, and it went all the way to the beginning. Okay, so uh, let's talk construction. So this corset here, you can see a close up of some of the flossing that I had done. Um, and I did it around the base of the spring steel instead of through the bottom. So you can kind of see how they're gripping right onto the bottom of them there. And it's kind of a cool picture that I got there to show you. And these were done on machine. Um, that's one of the blessings of the 19th century if you're making reproductions, you can use sewing machines, yay. Um, the coolest thing about that though, if you really want it to match more what they did in the era is you will lower your stitch length. Um, they used a much smaller stitch length in the 19th century than we do today. Um, average stitch length in the 19th century is 1.8 millimeters, where today it's about 4.0 millimeters. So if you want to sit there with a ruler and measure your stitches and uh, be a literal stitch counter at that point, go for it. Um, depending on what I'm doing, if I'm doing top stitching on an outfit, a lot of times I will lower my stitch length so it looks more appropriate. Um, their thread too was a cotton thread typically. They didn't have polyester thread up the wazoo like we have today. Um, and a lot of times it was a waxed cotton. It would be treated um, to help let make it last a little bit longer. All right, so this is um, the same corset as my bronze one, but this is a tan one or ivory. I know my colors tonight. Um, so the first thing you do on making a corset is the busk, which always seems the scariest part, but you get it done real quick. Um, all it is is you sew the two, uh, the lining in the front together and you just leave little spaces with back stitches on your machine for where those little hoops um, will go. And then you just put them in between the seams. And then you use a zipper foot, uh, an adjustable zipper, bleh, an adjustable zipper foot, say that five times fast, is always the best to use um, in, in this area when you're sewing the stitch down next to that uh, boning. Because I will let you know, I've done it many times, if you hit that, a uh, piece of steel, it will break your needle, it will scare you, but then you'll just put in a new needle and start again. The other part of the busk is the little uh, holes here for the, um, I guess the prongs. And um, what I usually do is I will lay the hooks over that part and take a pen and just mark little dots where they're gonna go, where they're gonna sit. And then I take a seam ripper or you could use an awl if you'd like and actually just stamp it. Um, what a lot of times they would do to create holes in garments is they would heat up a metal stamp and then hammer it in, which would actually melt these silk or natural fibers away. So that way it would actually seal it at the same time. Um, this is a polyester satin that I used, I think. Actually, it might've been silk. I have no idea. This, these are all dress scraps. <laughs> so I just kind of use what I have. Um, so that's how I did that. I actually used a seam ripper to cut a little hole and then popped those through. Now, the next part, of course, is to keep putting in all your panels. What you might, might want to do to help add on all these panels is just pin it as you go. And, um, you know, and that way pull it nice and tight so that way everything lines up. Otherwise, you might have a little wrinkle on the inside of your corset. My bronze one actually does have a little wrinkle on the inside of my corset, but you know what? No one's going to look at the inside, so I don't care. Um, and then here it is on my mannequin. Now this is after I trimmed it. Um, I don't think I included it, but I have a picture of my bronze one where it did not line up at all. It's all jagged on the bottom. So all you gotta do is just trim it to line it up and make it look nice and it'll be fine. That happens a lot with construction is that pieces move. So don't worry if it looks kind of funky. Now, um, at this point, this is where I have this done. I have all the, the seams put in there. Then I put the boning in and then I can add accents like lace. Lace was something that they did kind of in the later half. Um, I'm not sure if there was a specific purpose other than uh, just making it look prettier, um, but it was a very nice accent that you could put on the top. Um, so this is uh, bobbin lace that I had, um, and you can use needle lace or bobbin lace. Um, There's even early machine lace at this time. Um, in fact, machine netting, I believe they started in 
the 1820s, there was actually machine netted fabric uh, that came out that you could easily hand embroider on. Um, and there was a lot of dresses made out of that. So there was a lot of machine made items um, that people get surprised about in the 19th century. Um, this is a close up on uh, the top here. These are what's called false cording. So they are stitches that are on here, but there's no cording. A lot of uh, corsets would actually have cording in these areas, um, but because I was doing it um, not between seams, they were between uh, boning channels, I couldn't actually add cording that easily. So I just decided to do false ones. And that, that's something you could do if you're doing your first corset and you're a little nervous about the idea of cording. Cording is kind of obnoxious to do, as I found out. Um, and I'll show you a corset that's corded and talk about how that works um, in just a little bit. All right, so lace uh, ribbon corsets. So the pattern that I told you guys you could get free from the Ariana Black, um, it's called the rose corset, the ribbon corset. And it's printable, you can print it right off of line um, and you get all these little pieces. I traced this onto paper piecing paper. It is a quilting paper um, that is uh, you shred away and you can print on it, you can write on it, you can do all sorts of cool stuff. Um, and it's what, it's a great thing for paper piecing, also great for this. So I traced the corset patterns onto it and then made sure to draw in the waistline on all of these because that's where you start laying your pieces. So this is that cheap ribbon I told you guys about. The first one you do is you center it over that middle line. So wherever your waist is gonna sit on that pattern. And then you center the other ones on the top. And this is all of them. So I have other pieces that I laid and this is big ribbon, it's very thick. So I didn't have to use that many pieces to cover it. And I pinned it all to my paper, flipped it upside down and then sewed all around the edge. So I actually get my pattern piece. And it's a lot easier to do it in this method because um, otherwise you're trying to hold them all together and sew them without anything underneath. Once you have the whole corset done before you put the lining in, that's when you shred that paper away. So it's a really nice way. And so this is after I have it done, um, I had it all sewed together and I pulled out all those paper pieces. Those papers are recyclable, so definitely recycle them. Um, but it's something that you can get on Amazon um, just look up foundation paper piecing paper, and it's really easy and not that expensive to use. Um, you could also use regular tissue paper if you didn't have any um, foundation paper. But I recommend it if you're making a ribbon corset, and these guys are very easy to make. Um, and you just, this ribbon was from Meg Michaels. The other one I made was ribbon from a quilting store from Tula Pink. Um, so you could have some fun with some very accented, beautiful ribbons. Um, you could also make your own. The edges of this ribbon is actually surged with a rolled hem on a serger. So you could do the same thing. This is a three thread narrow rolled hem. Um, for those of you who know serger stitches um, along the edge of the serger or the ribbon. So you can make your own. This is just cotton. So pretty, pretty easy to do. Okay, this corset. This is a corded corset from 1870 or very early 1870s, 1872 or three. Um, was where this pattern was drafted off of. This was a lot of work. Um, so some of these channels are actual steel boning. Some of them are cording. This sort of corset has to be made in steps. Now, unfortunately, this was made in a rush because it was for an exhibit um, out in Utah and I had a week to make it. So I did not take photos as I was making it. In fact, this was supposed to be the mock-up and I was going to make another one and take photos of that, but well, didn't happen. They moved the date up. So um this is all all these little strips here all have either cording and boning in them like all of these down here are cording how that is made is you're going to have two pieces of fabric that you put together first that are bigger than your pattern piece and you sew in all of the seams for the cording and you have to take your cord and hand whip one end of the cord and then use that on a needle to pull through the seam it's obnoxious and there's a lot of them that that use that um, and then you will take uh, your piece and you'll cut it out and then put it um, with your front piece. So I actually did this with my fashion fabric, but you could also cover it with fashion fabric if you want instead. Um, and that will make your pieces. So every single one of these pieces had to be done with that where you did it all beforehand and then cut out your piece with the cording and sewed them together. Um, I admit I did not do that because I've never made one of these before this experience. experience. And so I um, put them in 
while I was making it, which is not the best because then, as you can see, you get these weird bumps near the seams. So, you know, it happens. But this was a pattern that I found on Etsy. It was an original uh, corset that someone made a pattern off of, um, and she's from France. Um, I think it was Atelier. Atelier Silphy, so A T E L I E R, and the la and the last uh, name of the business is Silphy S Y L P H E. So um, she has a bunch of original corsets in her collection that she makes patterns off of. So it's pretty cool to be able to take an original and uh, make an actual an actual reproduction. And of course, on the ribbon on the back, I think it's just shoelaces. <laughs> they actually did have lacing, and one thing you could do to make your own lacing is a lucet. Um, which is a weird little tuning fork and you could sit there and make your own lacing. Um, and a lot of women would sit there and do that um, as well because it was pretty pretty easy to do um, to do it. So that is that corset. And I think, yeah, and I think that was the last one in there um, for, <laughs> let me stop my share. There we go. So that was the last one um, that I had a uh, pictures of an example. Um, so there's other corsets I made in the past and other ones I don't have photos of. Um, so every one I make, I learn a little bit more. And that's what I suggest if you are new to making corsets, you know, you're certainly welcome to contact me um, on the Be Historical Facebook or um, my email or messenger, um, you know, wherever, wherever you know me from um, as you're making, uh, because I've always, I always learn something new as I'm making these. Um, and the funnest thing is to learn what innovations happened with each part of the corset and why they changed and why they altered. Uh, because as things are changing in our current life, it's hard to see the transition where when you look back across history, you can see that transition in the outfits and the fashion. So, you know, it's, it's cool to study that in history. <coughs> Excuse me. Whew. All right, so, um, I'm going to stop the recording and then have a question session.